I want to offer everyone a very warm welcome. I am Maude Brzezinski, and together with Elizabeth Mitchell, I'm serving as the interim co-director of the Cantor. Um, so I just want to say that in the short time that I've been in this role, I can say that I'm absolutely so very impressed by the hard work and the commitment of this Cantor staff. And you'll witness this tonight in learning about this exhibition. I want to acknowledge and thank our speakers who will be introduced shortly. I have the good fortune of working with Alan Holt and Anna Banks in their role as arts administrators. So it's a really huge treat for me tonight to hear them in their academic roles. Please know that we are working very hard to be ready to welcome all of you back to our museums. We're waiting on direction from Santa Clara County, as well as the higher education group that will give us the guidelines when we're ready to reopen. But we cannot wait to do this when it's safe to do so. In the last year, the COVID pandemic has forced us to rethink our relationship to home. As such, it's an even more celebratory moment that this exhibition is ready to be experienced, albeit first completely digitally. Until the canner can welcome you back in person, we're working to keep you engaged with our museums from home web feature. And I think that will be coming up in the chat so you can uh, use that link. And finally, we are grateful for the support of all of our members. You have been with the Cantor through thick and thin and with the Anderson as well. Your generosity enables the museum to share these profound and compelling digital experiences. If you're not a member and you would like to learn more, there will also be a link in the chat feature so you can join. So I'm going to say thank you, and I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Elizabeth Mitchell. Thank you, Maude, and thank everyone for joining us for tonight's event, a conversation with Siveria Simmons, Migration and Museums. Simmons was a visiting lecturer and the Solomon Fellow at Harvard University in 2020, making her an ideal guest to discuss with us how art can play a large role in the kinds of complex conversations that happen on university campuses. This event, as Maude said, marks the Cantor's opening of the exhibition, When Home Won't Let You Stay, Migration Through Contemporary Art which features work by Simmons and 17 other international contemporary artists reflecting on migration and related ideas of home and belonging. The Cantor Arts Center is the third and final venue for this exhibition. It's its only West Coast venue and the only university art museum to host it. It's one of the largest exhibitions that the Cantor has presented and it's installed throughout the museum. So we're thrilled to be opening it, but as you can imagine, it's a little bit better, bittersweet for the museum because we can't be there. The exhibition is a visually compelling and intellectually immersive experience, and every Cantor staff member in some way was involved in its realization. While we can't share the exhibition in person quite yet, uh, we're very excited to be able to share tonight's conversation with all of you. But uh, before we begin, I just want to remind everyone to check the chat and look at our newly announced Asian American Art Initiative. So there should be a link in there and the business. Um, I also want to acknowledge that the exhibition is organized by Ruth Erickson, the Mannion Family Curator, and Eva Respini, the Barbara Lee Chief Curator with Annie Pulagura, Curatorial Assistant, Institute of Contemporary Art, Boston. The Cantor Arts Center presentation is organized by Maggie Detloff, Assistant Curator of Photography and New Media, and Jessica Ventura, our Curatorial Assistant. We gratefully acknowledge the support from the Halperin Exhibition Fund. And congratulations, Maggie and Jessica. And now I'll turn it over to Maggie to tell us a little bit more about the exhibition and introduce our speakers. Hi everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Maude, for that wonderful welcome. And thank to thank thank you to all of you for joining us here tonight. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce this event and the exhibition it accompanies, as well as our speakers. 
So as was mentioned, tonight marks the virtual opening of When Home Won't Let You Stay. Um, until we can welcome you to see the show in person, we've prepared a really robust web experience and a virtual tour of the show, as well as a slate of related programs to be held over Zoom like this one. Stay tuned um, for more details and links coming later. I'd like to start with a few thank yous. Um, this exhibition was an ambitious project and there are many, many people who deserve our utmost thanks. Thanks first go to my curatorial counterparts and brilliant originators of this exhibition, Ava Raspini and Ruth Erickson at ICA Boston, as well as their senior registrar, Allison Hatcher um, and their whole team. At the Cantor, there is no department that didn't contribute to this project. And on the individual level, there's no staff member whose support and enthusiasm I didn't feel. So thank you to everyone. I regret there isn't time to say everyone's name out loud, um, but I'd like to expressly thank a few people for their indispensable work on the installation, events, marketing, website, and virtual tour, without which we would, have, um, we would not have this opening today. So in the interest of time, I'll go through them rather quickly, but no, I appreciate you. Stephanie Midlock, Shanna Dixon, Al Lewis, Danny Meltzner, Martin Splisma, Ashley McGrew, Jeff Fairbairn, Steve Green, Mackenzie Lynch, Aubrey Beam, Kwang Mi Ro, Diane Holliday, Urmi Sheff, Sarah Larson, Beth Judicessi, Heidi Sigwa Campbell, Margaret Whitehorn, Robert De Armand, Michael James Heffernan, and Tammy Fortin. Very special thanks and congratulations to my closest collaborators on this exhibition, Katie Clifford, Brooks Manbeck, Tiffany Sacato, Kate Hollihan, Jess Ventura, and Mary Jose Alvarado Luna. This exhibition would not have been possible without the efforts of former Cantor director Susan Dackerman and deputy director James Gaddy. And I'd like to thank the Cantor's, Cantor's interim co-directors, Elizabeth Mitchell and Maude Brzezinski, especially for their ongoing support and encouragement, not to mention their absolutely wonderful welcome remarks. When Home Won't Let You Stay considers how contemporary artists are responding to the unprecedented amounts of migration, immigration, and displacement across the globe today. Featuring work by artists who are from, live in, or work in over a dozen different countries, the show highlights their diverse responses to migration, ranging from personal reflections to poetic meditations. Migration is not a new phenomenon, but this exhibition also calls attention to how it changes through various historical, political, and social developments. The show is organized around several overlapping themes, exploring ideas of home, sites and modes of transit, provisional structures like borders and refugee camps, and narratives of displacement and belonging. Storytelling and collective memory also play a large role. Each artwork tells a specific story but taken together, the works in the show also speak to global trends and common experiences. Although the exhibition tells many stories, no single exhibition can include every story. Because migration and issues of home and belonging are personal matters to so many of us, I would argue for all of us, it's my goal to welcome as many voices as I can into the conversation. I'm so pleased that tonight we will hear from one of the exhibition artists and a number of our Stanford community members. These additional voices are crucial for engaging in profound conversations about the issues this exhibition addresses. Especially after police officers murdered George Floyd and other Black individuals this summer and protests in support of Black lives hit the streets in full force, it became very clear how important it was that the Cantor's presentation of this show, already very um, challenging, that our presentation of this show consider the complex histories that shaped our own diverse nation and region. Um, and I wanted it especially to interrogate how past patterns of movement and habitation and legal and de facto restrictions on civil rights and freedoms have directly influenced where we are in our current moment. Of all the work in the show, I felt that Zyveria's work speaks most clearly about this her Sundown series literally layers images and imagery referring to different discrete and ongoing moments affecting African-American lives and others, such as the Great Migration and colonialism, emphasizing for the viewer how interconnected the past, present, and future are. 
Being located on a university campus, we also wanted to explore how our museum and arts community at Stanford and others like ours could uniquely contribute to these kinds of crucial conversations around migration, racial justice, and human rights. To that end, we invited colleagues who are leaders in the arts and education to join us tonight. And now it's my pleasure to formally welcome and introduce our speakers. Siveria Simmons' sweeping body of work includes photography, performance, choreography, video, sound, sculpture, and installation. Simmons received her BFA from Bard College in 2004 after spending two years on a walking pilgrimage retracing the transatlantic slave trade with Buddhist monks. She completed the Whitney Museum's independent study program in studio art in 2005, while simultaneously completing a two-year actor training conservatory with the Maggie Flanagan Studio. Simmons' works are in major museums and private collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, Deutsche Bank, UBS, the Guggenheim Museum, the Agnes Gunn Collection, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the Studio Museum in Harlem, ICA Miami, Perez Art Museum Miami, the Weatherspoon Art Museum, the Nasher Art Museum, Durham and the High Museum, among many others. Her exhibitions and performances have been reviewed extensively both in the US and internationally. She was a visiting lecturer and the Solomon Fellow at Harvard University, as Elizabeth mentioned, and has been awarded the Charles Flint Kellogg Award in Arts and Letters from Bard College this summer. This fall and winter, Simmons will have works on view at Socrates Sculpture Park, Times Square, the Wallach Art Gallery at Columbia University, the Moody Gallery at Rice University, our university, and the Liverpool Biennial, among many other exhibitions. In conversation with Siberia tonight are our valued Stanford Arts colleagues, Alan Holt and Adam Banks. Alan Holt is director at the Institute for Diversity in the Arts at Stanford University. There she trains undergraduates in the areas of diversity and culture, arts leadership, and social justice. She's a mother and practicing artist whose work includes theater, poetry, and film. She is a 2018 Sundance Fellow, a 2018 SF Film Screenwriting Fellow, and a frequent contributor on air at KQED Arts. In 2016, Alon's artist book, Moonwork, was published by Candor Arts Chicago and was shortlisted for the Cornish Family Prize at the Melvin Art Book Fair. Since its release, Moonwork resides in several private and public institutions around the country. Alon has over 10 years experience considering questions of identity, diversity, culture, and aesthetics, and holds a degree with honors in comparative studies in race and ethnicity from Stanford University. A committed teacher, midnight believer, and a slow jam in a hip hop world, Adam Banks is the faculty director of the Institute for Diversity in the Arts and the program in writing and rhetoric. As a professor in the Graduate School of Education, he also teaches regularly in the programs in African and African American studies and science, technology, and society. His scholarship lies at the intersection of black rhetorical traditions and technology issues. A former chair of the College on Conference Composition and Communication, Banks is also the founder of the Smitherman Villanueva Scholarly Writing Retreat, designed for emerging scholars of color working on their first book in areas related to language and literacy. He's the author of Race, Rhetoric, and Technology, Searching for Higher Ground, Digital Griots, African American Rhetoric in a Multimedia Age, and a collaborative book with Keith Gilliard on African American Rhetoric. In 2020, he was named a Bass University Fellow for his contributions to undergraduate education at Stanford. Partway through tonight's event, three of the Cantor's impressive student guides, Ayawade Balagun, majoring in African and African American Studies, class of 21, Sadie Blancaflor, majoring in Earth System Science and Anthropology, class of 22, and Melissa Santos, a major in psychology with a minor in Spanish and co-term in sociology, class of 21, will be joining the conversation and sharing their perspectives as Stanford students deeply invested in examining Stanford's history and current day. If you have questions during the event, please drop them in the chat or send them to the panelists and we'll address them during the Q&A portion towards the end of the event. To get the conversation started, I'll ask, I'll ask Siberia to tell us a little bit about how the two artworks in this exhibition, Found the Sea Like the River and Sundown Number 12, fit into the broader of, of her work. Are themes of migration, movement, and the past a consistent part of your work, Siberia? 
Hi, everybody. Um, it's nice to see you. And thank you so much, Maggie, for that intro. Um, it's such an honor to be in conversation today. Um, themes of migration. Uh, actually, they have been, you know, a part of my practice for quite a long time. Um, the two works that I have inside of the exhibition, though, are, are fairly newer works. And when um, the ICA Boston was, you know, conceptualizing the work, they originally asked me to show a large scale work that I produced in 2010 called Super Unknown, Super Unknown which is a large scale grid of migrants mid migration. It's, it's, it's a lot of journalistic imagery. And I, and, and we were talking about migration and the, and you know, the current events of the day of 2010 19 and 20. And I, you know, spoke to the curators and I said, you know, Black Americans who descend from slavery in this country um, have been migrating, forced migration inside of the country for the whole time. So while I've taken global um, perspectives on migration, I think it's really important to kind of both remind myself and then also to remind audiences. And in this and these are themes that I've worked on that, you know, in terms of black Americans and, you know, the country itself is basically, um, has basically worked to terrorize, um, terrorize the home, the home ability. I'm going to make that word up, right? The home ability, you know, of, of, of black folks who descend from slavery. And that's been going on since we were, um, sold, you know, by uh, African traders or captured and or captured by Europeans. And then, I mean, once that, that happened, home is, there's, there's, there's a, a, a shift in home. And then with our intermingling, we could never uh, fully capture uh, the parts of ourselves that make, make us up, you know, like we're, we're all like a, if you want to use the word race, a mixed race group, right? We're all, you know, Black Americans who descend from slavery. We're all um, different parts of the diaspora as well as, you know, European and, and First Nations a lot of the time. And it, it's, all a, it's all a displacement, but what's home is actually the United States, right? Like when you, when you really sit with the history of, of the transatlantic slavery, what's home is the United States. And we have never been able to fully ground ourselves here in home because it's, it's a constant state of terror through, through white supremacy, basically. So those things are kind of always in my work in different ways. Thank you so much. First, I just wanna say it's an honor to be in conversation with you tonight. We're gonna to go some deep places as you've already just laid the groundwork for us. <laughs> It's an honor to be in conversation with my colleague, Professor Adam Banks. And I would um, both of you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you hit on so many things that I think will transition us to our first question. Um, but when you said the home ability of a people, I was just very struck by that and reminded, um, which we learned from the 1619 Project, when formerly enslaved peoples were given the opportunity to return back to the continent that we chose to stay and we chose to make home in this place. And so just thinking about the complex nature of home in that way um, that you brought up and alluded to in your first question, in your first response was, you know, just something I'm, I'm really holding dear. And so with that, my first question is, as diasporic peoples, our personal histories give insight to the wide range of migration stories that make up Black identity and culture. So could you just tell us a little bit about your family and personals, uh, personal journey, uh, physical journey through place sure. and how the space that you've inhabited and show up and influence your work? Sure, um, which it's, that's a nice question. People don't really ask those types of questions. Um, so that's nice, a grounding question, but you know, my, obviously both my, both sides of my lineage are uh, descendants of slavery. And, you know, I've known that kind of my whole life. And, you know, it becomes much more uh, in focus as I mature. Um, my father's side is from Georgia and my father was a sharecropper and he 
I, you know, we've never talked about being terrorized per se, um, all the different ways, but um, his family was from Georgia and uh, he was a 17 year old sharecropper who left Georgia and moved to New York and, and became like a, a business person in New York. And then my mother's side is from South Carolina um, my grandmother has told me many stories about all of the different um, intermingling that happened there that constructed who she was. Um, so, you know, I understand myself as being like a total American construction, you know, and I, and I recognize that. Um, and I'm from New York and, you know, my family is mostly here now. Um, although we do have our Southern roots and I feel very connected to the South, of course, because I feel like the South definitely holds a lot of the narrative of my people and also the, the whole group that I come from. Um, and yeah, so now we're all here in New York, which is quite an interesting place um, to be. But it is, you know, when I think about my whole family history, I can see the instances where um, the, the history of the country the, the, the redlining, the, um, the, the kind of great migration, forced traveling, the terror mm -hmm. from the South, the sharecropping. I can see all of that inside of the narrative of my family. My, my grandfather be working for uh, airlines as a porter and then as like, you know, moving up from a porter onwards. And, you know, and then, you know, my father owning funeral homes that, you know, buried black bodies. So it's, it's, it's deep because mm -hmm. I recognize the history of our country inside of the actions of my family members. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me follow up on that a bit in, um, in the sense of history and migration for black people here. We've, we've had several decades of, you know, art, scholarship, literary work around how the the great migration, you know, out of, of those folks from South to North is, is such a, a major part of our experience. I'm wondering what you think the sort of narrative or the, the major theme of, of uh, migration for Black folks in this space, what, what the contemporary narrative looks like, you know, what are some of the themes under that for you? Uh, and I think there's some things we can do from there, but I'm curious, like, what, what would you just say in this moment, what, what that arc looks like or what's a part of it? I mean, I think from this moment, I mean, all of it's tied to economics, right? Like all of it's tied to the resources that we have, all of it's tied to the resources that we don't have. I think, um, you know, depending on which generation you're talking about, I mean, yeah. I think there are some people who benefited from um, action of affirmative action and the civil rights acts. And, and I think there is a cushion, I mean, barely a cushion that some black folks have that are mature, like in their right. like sixties and above, like who yep. have some cushion because of the civil rights act and, and affirmative action, you know, so they have homes, they have, they have a sense of stability, but yep. I think the generations after that mm -hmm. are really, um, in a, in a, in a, in a pickle, as we, as I want to say, you know, we, you know, don't have as many resources. We don't have as much access to resources right. as a group. I'm talking about the group, you know, there's individual, you know, glow ups or whatever, but yeah. as a group economically, and you can look at all the data and statistics mm -hmm. and see, like, we don't have the resources to, can, to have home fully. Mm -hmm. So once again, I think you're having a situation where you know, people are in their 30s and 40s, they they're saddled with student debt, and they're trying to figure out like, how am I going to make home? Where is home? How am I going to take care of mom and dad? Like I know, you know, my white counterparts, my non black counterparts, you know, oftentimes have more resources, they're able to take care of mom and dad, they're able or they're going to get an inheritance from mom and dad. But that is not the black American narrative. We're not getting uh, inheritances passed down as a group. So we are in a pickle right now because we're having to face the student loan debt, the, you know, our counter, seeing what our, what's happening with our counterparts. Then we're trying to figure out how we're going to get loans for homes, mm -hmm. um, t children, all these things. And I think, um, you know, there's a debt owed to our ancestors and there's a debt that is owed to us because 
we are just living the results of this history. And we are now here and we're all, and this is what you saw this summer is your, you saw uh, a reaction to a knowing, I think yeah. an internal knowing that I may not be able to have home. Yeah. And that's a big deal. Like I may not be able to have home stability, which equals like, you mm -hmm. know, mental sanity and care. So mm -hmm. I, I, and you know, and I've heard, um, I know Charles Blow, the, the, the Times writer, you know, he's come out with a, a book that talks about reversing the great migration, which mm -hmm. is, which is an interesting proposition, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know what I mean? I'm like, okay, so he's <laughs> saying, you know, go back south and, you know, start planting seeds there or reaping the seeds or I don't know, like, you know, yeah. aggregating together and, you know, creating a voting block, which I think is something interesting. But mm -hmm. for those people who you know, want to stay in their, in their, their places, cities, towns. I mean, yeah. we are in a real pickle unless we advocate politically. Um, mm -hmm. And then also, unless we get white folks and other non-black folks to involve themselves in the politics, we may be a generation of people mm -hmm. who are once again, migrating around, around mm -hmm. um, living in rental properties without the necessary resources um, to, to survive and thrive, really, to we don't need to survive. We need to thrive. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, your your invocation of Charles Blow is is interesting because, in a lot of ways, what he's proposing has been in action for thirty plus years. Right? Folks have blown Atlanta up, Charlotte up, Memphis, Houston. So we've seen a good amount of that for a lot of different reasons, but also we. Like we can't talk about migration in the uh, the Black U.S. context without looking at we've we've had basically fifty you know six fifty seven you know years or so of migration of Black folk from various parts of the world being legalized, mm -hmm. and, and and so you know the who the we is there there you, you make it a point to emphasize a very particular experience inside the US black experience. When you talk about folks who are descended from slaves here in this space, but we've we've been having, you know, the Caribbean massive, we've been having folks from African countries, you know, uh, here where their generations deep now. Yeah. And so given that side of migration, are are we at a point where we have to redefine what black in the US context is based on those developments? I think that only, re I mean, I think black, I think that only relates to, you know, a, a claim against the country as far as like a financial claim okay. involving reparations. I, I mean, we're black, we're black folks. We, we know, you know, it's, we're coming from different parts of the country, of parts of the yeah. world, yeah. you know, and we live amongst each other and, you know, we all, you know, it, I think where there's a distinction and what I understand it to be is it just has to do with a reparative claim. Like mm -hmm. if I went to, if I might, which I've traveled throughout, you know, yeah. different parts of the continent, I've traveled throughout, um, you know, different parts of the Caribbean. And if I were to move to, let's say Haiti next year, I don't have a claim on that country. I can't yeah. go to France and say like, I'm, I'm here, I, I, I need repair, like you've mm -hmm. done me harm. It's like, well, no, I mean, America has done Haiti harm, <laughs> you know right. what I mean? So right. that's another type of, that's another type of claim. But I think in terms of black Americans who descend from slavery in particular, I, I think that's the only distinction. I think mm -hmm. other than that, we're, you know, we're, we're all together, but mm -hmm. there is a particular claim that I think black Americans who descend from slavery here right. have a claim. And I think people who, you know, descend from slavery in Haiti, who, you know what I mean? They have a different claim. And then if you go to, you know, Jamaica, there's another claim. There's so many claims. Mm -hmm. And I think we all have to kind of, advocate on those claims, you know, yeah. and keep them alive because at some point the, the bill is going to come, it's due, you know, it's going to come to pass, you know, For sure. whether it be when our generation or the next. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then in, in the, who is the we in that situation? And I think the we is all of us, the we is the American people, the we is all of us, especially in that context. And so just wanting to like underscore that 
And to, to think about even the Charles Blow piece, which a lot of my friends were circulating as well, you know, which is about the history of diasporic people and how our political power is, can be diluted if we're not in the same geographical location. And so what does it mean to return to the South, for example, and to really build up that power, but also build up, as you brought up before, land ownership, home ownership, claims in that space. Um, and of course, that well, would be- I mean, we, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, well, I was just going to say, I mean, we have to get with the basic numbers. I think as, as a group, we, as, as, as a population, we've got to understand our numbers, like what, you know, Black Americans are magnified. We are like, we become like this kaleidoscope of, of, it's almost as if there's so many of us, but they're really, I mean, there's like, I think we're like 13, 14% of the population people who identify as white Americans are like about 65, 70% of the population. But our culture is magnified so to such a degree that it seems as if there's so many of us in comparison. And when you think about, you know, what happened this summer with the, up, the uprisings revolution, you know, I mean, it, you understand, I, I, it, I, won't even, I, I, I won't go there just yet, but... Um, we you know, it. we our our struggle our struggle here is magnified, and and it. Um, I think we understand now the level of oppression that we live under, and I think the people who are oppressing us, because they are as a group, are also starting to see it. Part of them, part of part part of that group, not all of them, but part of that group. So it's it's an interesting. Um, conundrum we have here that's to put it lightly yeah when you start digging into the the roots of injustice you know I would be remiss to say Stanford sits on Moekma alone land and so when you start to dig into the roots of home and space we can't even begin to have that conversation without acknowledging indigenous presence indigenous peoples of the United States and beyond and so that you know, our, our new poet laureate of, of San Francisco, Tongo Elson Martin reminded us that we still have children in cages because of migration and immigration and, and our policies and stances on that. Um, and so it just, it unravels. And so I'm always reminded um, of Linda Sarsour who says, if we take care of the most vulnerable of us then we all, if the most vulnerable of us have what we need we all have what we need. And that idea that's underscored with there is no democracy unless there is black liberation embedded in that sense of democracy. So you're hitting on all of the points, <laughs> all of the points. Um, maybe I'll just take us back into some questions around uh, the work that's in uh, the current exhibition when home won't let you stay. Um, and I'll bounce it back to Adam. Um, so I wanna talk, I was just so moved by um, sundown number 12 just so moved by that, especially as it just like reroutes our sense of home just to something very, very particular, but also the institutionalized ways that we've been uh, relegated into different space. So, you know, we were, you brought this up earlier, but we were reminded the legacy of sundown towns this past summer when protests against racial injustice were met with citywide curfews, which scholars and artists and activists were quick to draw those lines between curfews and sundown policies that, you know, permeated through the South and other um, towns around the world. And so just that dichotomy of uh, black people, especially black women who were taking up most of the domestic work of that time, um, able to care for the homes of white individuals, but also taken away from their particular homes and often relegated in terms of space in that way. And so just curious about what legacies you're evoking in this piece and how you work materially to make that come across in the work. And all of that. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's complicated. Well, yeah. I'll just get technical a little bit about the work. Um, historically, I um, I started making this work because I really I, I I said before I you know as I'm you know let's say 50 years from now like I want to be able to say that I've told told the narrative of this place that I am from you know so that my kids my grandkids whoever like they will understand from my perspective what happened so this is a this is a work in progress uh, a project that I I will continue to build upon and um, you know a lot of the images uh, inside of the image um, are taken taken you know some of them are taken from the public domain you know because what something that I always say is that 
you know, the United States has kept some good records. Like we are not as like confused. The, the country is not as confused as it tries to pretend to be. The amnesia that happens every 20 years, um, you know, is intentional. So we have the records. We have the records of who whose lands were um, taken uh, and what transactions were happening um, to get that land. We have that. We have record of you know who the slaveholders were inside of the South. We have record of who insured the ships and all of these things. So for me, it's really just. And, and then we have record of the. The contemporary record is 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 abundant you know what i mean about who came when and who did what and so for me it's just been really important to recover this narrative not recover but use this narrative to to just go inside of these um these publicly available archival spaces and work with the materials that are ours it also has to do with economics like i think a lot about you know, we, we understand that we pay taxes. We understand that we um, have a right to certain things, but you know, we have, we don't necessarily use everything that we are capable of using. And so it's important to me to use, you know, the, 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 the common narrative that's, that is held via our tax dollars through images, through recordings, through sound, through films, through documents, it's important for me to make sure that as a tax paying citizen here in this country who's, whose ancestors descended and worked to build this country that I use the, the, um, the resources available to me mm -hmm. and available to every citizen here um, freely. And so that's why I started to use the images inside. And, and, you know, I won't give everything away because I really do love for art to kind of spark different conversations. But I, I will say that um, this project has been going on now for a couple of years and I'm still working through it. And, and the characters have shifted. Um, the, the, the stance has shifted. The, 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 uh, the things that the character holds and does has shifted to kind of think through, you know, technology, to think through witnessing, to think through mm -hmm. um, uh, kind of a cultural amnesia and to bring, a, you know, there's text involved with this work and meaning text inside of the images. Um, and, and I try to go through different modes and moments of our history. Cause you know, again, there's the long history of of this land, which is which is held in First Nations communities. And then there's the short history, which is like the first contact with Europeans that then resulted in the disaster that we have here. Mm -hmm. And and speaking of the disaster in the current moment, uh, you and Alan have both set up this connection in different ways, but in, in so it is such a rich way the United States is a sundown town now, right? We, the the extrajudicial murder of black people by police kind of reinscribes that all of the time. And we, we could point to so many, you know, other elements of, of how that suffocating uh, presence comes to be. The reason I mentioned that now though, in, in connection with uh, your piece, so prior, mass migration moments in the US uh, for black people were accompanied by both terror and hope, right? So, you know, there's a terror of what we were leaving in the South coming up to the North, you know, in those waves of great, great migration. And there was the hope in what people could put together, you know, for themselves and their communities in a new land. When, when we think about the movement of, of Black folks within these borders in, in the last couple of decades, yes, part of it is connected to opportunity, as you've mentioned, but there's also the, the, the reality of the, what Derek Bell would talk about as the permanence of racism sets in in really profound ways. And so I set all of that up to kind of, I'm, I'm trying to strike this contrast, right? So in, in, in some of the second wave of great, the great migration story, you know, around the civil rights era, you had uh, in the aftermath of Brown v. Board, for example, black folk 
chanted free by 63 to suggest that, you know, a lot of the work that remained to be done could take place between that moment of the Brown v. Board decision and the centennial of, of the Emancipation uh, Proclamation being signed, right? There, there's nothing in, in Black discourse right now about, you know, yeah, we're going to get through this stuff in the next nine years. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we have to sit with a permanence of some of this, right? And so how does that for you mark the, the place? How does that mark the spaces in which we live, work, play, socialize? You know, when to, to invoke Langston, you know, does it sag like a heavy load? Uh, what does that permanence do to the spaces we inhabit for you? Mm. The problem is, is that, so I don't use, I work with language a lot. I don't use like, I don't call it racism anymore. I just yeah. call it whiteness. For me, yeah. that word does mean nothing. Racism, I don't know what the hell that is. That, that means whiteness to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I try to replace when I think racism and I think that white folks and, and when I say white people, even I don't even mean it's, it is the group that ha, that that identifies and that we identify. But it's also new. It's also people who move to the United States with the hope that whiteness fulfills because no one moves to the United States so that they can align with like First Nations folks people who, you know, Mexican folks who lost their land not long ago and, you know, you know, Puerto Rico, or, no one moves there so that they can discuss Puerto Rico and it's in what's going on in Puerto Rico, right? Like we moved to the United States to fulfill a European idea of, of humanity. So for me, you know, I, 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 I we, we, we are not even at the point where we can like change language quickly. We can't even code switch. Like we, we, it's hard for black folks to do it. So it's even harder for white folks and those who identify to do it where they can literally, instead of saying racism, instead of saying diversity and inclusion, they can start saying whiteness and all the ways that whiteness um, oppresses. And that is, the, that is the language that we need to start working with and changing consistently and all the time. Um, and, and then as far, I think you're asking about like hope in a way or like, or like the future. Can I, can I ask for clarification? No, no, happy to clarify. I, I was saying in some of those past migration moments, the terror that people might've been fleeing was also accompanied by a hope that something could become better. I'm saying in this moment, you know, I, I like how you uh, talked about the need for language to catch up to the reality. When we're dealing with an enduring white supremacy, one thing this moment shows us is the permanence of that. Uh, and that we, we don't have, I don't know that the hope for resolution or repair to go back to your other word is as resonant now as, so I would, the short answer to your question, no. In this moment, when I ask you how that enduring white supremacy affects the places, the spaces that we occupy, I'm not talking about the hope that might have accompanied other moments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's stressful. I think that, yeah. I think that, you know, if I'm just, to, I'm gonna flatten my language for the audience just so that I can speak quickly, even though I don't really like speaking in this way, but I'm just gonna say that black folks and brown folks in particular, First Nations people, um, you know, people in Puerto Rico, you know, people in, in islands that are all, and then the world really, because the United States has, is an empire, right? That we, we don't even, we, <laughs> we have to deal with this stuff. And then black, even black folks, it's like, we, we, consider the United States a lot because it's, it's, it's our, it's, 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 it's a source of a lot of turmoil, um, you know, but there's a whole other world connection that we, we, we sometimes have to get to. But I think that, I think, you know, I think that black folks, brown folks, we under, we really, I mean, we've always understood it, but we really understand it now. Like, we re and what we understand is that the white folks actually do also understand it. And for some reason, liberal 
neoliberal white folks are not doing anything really about it. Like, so that's a really hard, uh, what is it wrote? What is the expression? Ho to wrote, what? Uh, a really, well, I don't know the language what I'm trying to say, but it's a, a really, exactly. It's, it's really tough because we're looking at our friends, loved ones, lovers, and we're like, okay, so what you gonna do? How are you gonna, how are you gonna undo? How are you gonna make it right? How are you gonna start to advocate? How are you gonna start to repair? Because you have all the resources and you also have military might. And, mm -hmm. and the capital uh, insurrectionists, those are your cousins, brothers, aunties, mamas, aunts, uncles. So, the, so we're looking at you. We're literally just looking at you like, so what's gonna happen? Like, are you just gonna let, you're, are you just gonna let it continue? And you're gonna let the United States continue to be this oppressive state? Or are you gonna, are you gonna basically be a race traitor and go against your group and start to repair and undo? And I think that this is the pressure that black folks understand. And I, and I think there are a lot, some young white folks and you know, who understand, you know, mm -hmm. but the majority of, of white folks in this country have continued to be complacent to the issues that they see happening right before them. Mm -hmm. And we can't even get off of Maine. I, I have to reiterate, we can't even get off of mainland United States. Like mm -hmm. I can't even, this amount of oppression forces me to have re repetitive conversations. Mm -hmm. So I can't talk about, you know, even my homies, like I, I keep bringing up Puerto Rico, <laughs> like I can't even talk about my homies there, right? Because like, I'm still trying to figure out what happened in the South during yeah. the Civil War. It's like, this is no way to, to, to be a human being, to be mm -hmm. real honest. And, and I think that I try to put all of this inside of my work. And that's probably why I work in so many different ways is because mm -hmm. I'm trying to articulate, this is no way to be. Right. as a human being and i still have to i still am a creative creature mm -hmm. so let me offer one uh quick follow-up before passing it back to alan because of what you're talking about the weight of all of this on this place have you been thinking about uh digital migration mm. I no, I probably not, but you, you can give it to me. <laughs> Maybe I have, I don't know. <laughs> so, be, so even within this space, you know, the U S we're, we're so scattered, you know, from our families, folks left for school, they left for work, you know, the, the physical places bear so much black folk are living really important parts of their lives in the virtual, in the digital, right? Mm. Uh, whether, mm. whether it's black Twitter, whether it's TikTok, whether it's Vine from a few years ago, People are finding community that sustains them. And then, you know, of course, movement happens from, you know, folks ain't on Black Planet no more, right? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. they've mm -hmm. gone to other places. And so I'm wondering about how we move from digital space to digital space as a part of having to deal with the, the terror of what's happening in physical space. You know, that's, that's really interesting. Cause I, <laughs> when, <clears throat> excuse me, whenever you talk to black folks in particular, and I don't know, I'm, I, you know, and I want to say black and brown folks, cause I'm, I'm curious if, 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 if folks talk this way. Um, but with black folks, we always, I'm always thinking about how people are saying like space is the place or, and this has been for decades or, you know, they want to, they, they're, they're ready to lift off. Like this is a part, like we're always ready to go. We are like, where, and, and is, there was like this popular song, Earth is a Ghetto or something, right? Like we're always ready to leave this place because it's stressful. And I think that the digital space of course offers us like so many communities, so much, so much, you know, awakening, you know, and, 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 and a sense of responsibility um, to each other in a way that probably hasn't happened before. So I think in that way, you know, there's hope because we are seeing our collectivity and we're also able to express ourselves, express ourselves in safe spaces, oftentimes, not all the time, um, and, and develop communities that we might not otherwise had. So 
thank you actually for reminding me that that is a possibility, even though I, <laughs> at the end of the day, I do, I do want us to, to have the, the material condition, the, the material resources that we need so that we can live comfortably digitally earthbound in Mongolia or wherever the hell we want to go. I think the time is now for us to be able to do that, which we want to do to be functioning, happy, creative human beings. Sensual. I, I, I don't want to forget that because that gets lost. Sensual beings. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with that, we want to um, invite our student scholars up to take us even deeper because I've seen some of those questions and we're going to go even further into this conversation. So uh, with that, we invite our student scholars to join us on this virtual stage. They look like they didn't come to play. <laughs> yes. Hello, everybody. <laughs> the way you joined on, it was very impactful, the way you joined. <laughs> uh, Melissa, Sadie, Ayawade, welcome. I know you have some questions for Zyveria um, and for maybe for all of us. So we welcome your questions. Hi, every, hi, you all. I just want to say, also, you can just give it to people. You don't have to ask questions because you know what's going on. We'll take both. Um, well, I'm happy to, to jump in and start um, and um, to start by echoing what Alan had said earlier. Um, uh, I really appreciated um, your made up word homability and um, have kind of been like sitting with that throughout throughout your talk. And um, uh, and I guess I would I want to start by saying that uh, I guess a lot of how I would describe what I'm interested in academically, artistically, personally, um, is um, home mobility um, for Black folks as it's tied to um, land and as it's tied to relationships to land and the environment. Um, uh, so also coming off of um, your discussion of sundown number 12, I'd love to hear um, uh, just your reflections on the use of natural elements in that work. Um, that was something that I really appreciated in the in the layering and the complexity um, of the history of those natural elements that you used. Um, so I, I'd love to bring that into the space and, and hear more from you too. Oh, thank you so much. Um, you know, I started off my 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 studio practice many many years ago, um, really in, in, in enveloped in natural landscape in in the natural landscape, right? And I and I and I think that's tied to um, my real sincere love of um, uh, landscape painting, landscape photography, and you know, in the art historical canon, like I, I've always been obsessed with um, French landscape painting, and um, you know, it's and and then obviously even the Hudson River School. I mean, these are these are um, stunning examples of work that now I understand as I've matured again I understand what exactly the legacy especially in the Americas what that means like what's missing from those those narratives and those conversations um, inside of those paintings that we've you know pretty much everyone has grows up with some kind of landscape image inside of their home, whether it be a poster or like a, something that the dry cleaner gave you there's always you know, that's usually your first contact with, with, with artworks. And so for me, that was, I was the same and the natural elements, the landscape, I, I, I used to see it as a source of um, calm, of respite, of, of reflection. But obviously now having spent a lot of time researching, I understand that, you know, landscape can be a burden also. And obviously when you think about enslavement and you think about being taken from uh, one homeland and then f forced via another landscape to via the sea to another landscape. I mean, and then forced to labor in that landscape for centuries. You know, landscape has taken a different meaning, but of course, of course, like I, like everyone else also finds repair and reflection and and uh, 
hope and restoration inside of the landscape. So I kind of walk with both of those kind of things in mind as I, as I make work. I see. Thank you so much um, for, for breaking that down. And um, yeah, I appreciate hearing that and hearing where um, uh, almost what feels like a tension between like recognizing, you know, what what um, like structural inequality, structural racism can make appear as if the land itself is hostile when really like you know, that's an extension of this larger system. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, th that layer um, with the the element of healing and and calm and respite um uh both feel so palpable in the work um, um so i really appreciate that thank you sadie feel free to take it away or melissa yeah hi it's so wonderful to meet you um my name is sadie i study earth systems and anthropology at, here at stanford um, i'm a junior and I guess I'm really interested in sort of like the lasting impacts of colonization and sort of how they've like fundamentally altered our landscape and in terms of like the environmental, de environmental degradation and like the lasting impacts of like labor exploitation. Um, and something that I was really reflecting on like listening to you um, speak today and also like while um, looking through the history of your art, um, I like Stanford has this like really long history of like continued interactions with the Mwekma Ohlone tribe on which like Stanford's land, um, St the Stanford as an institution is located. And I'm curious to your thoughts as to like, what does like a decolonial framework look like through the lens of, you know, what actions museums have to take? Um, yeah. Ooh, ciao. Okay, that's a mouth. You said a mouthful, and you said it with a smile. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, that is the question of the day, really. I think that um, I think what I want to say to you, young folks, is that you have a responsibility to hold these places accountable. The problem is, is that we are in these spaces for a short period of time. We are there for uh, four years, you know, and then and then we move on, and you know we get our degrees and we move on. And I think, you know, you represent the place that you get your degrees from. So if you are, you know, a student at Stanford, you it's it's on you to it's it it behooves you as a student, and then after to continue engaging with the university and continuing to make demands on the university to, to change, to, to, to give land back, to, to provide reparations or at least advocate for it on a federal level. I mean, you know, we, we actually, and we don't realize it, you know, as young, we, you, I think young folks do as much more, but people in the United States have the ability to change the structures we just it's it's frightening because there's there's the might of weapons but beyond that our, our collective force has the ability to shift things and especially now because we understand the histories we we hold them the data we understand it all so it's really about working with your community building community working with community you know, Stanford, your student group should be in contact with Harvard's student group, with Harvard's prison investment group, should be con in contact with the First Nations, you know, people of all different universities who are advocate. You guys have to build the force, you know, and then you have to sustain it. And then when you leave, you've got to pass down the legacy. The institution stays, the people leave. So how can the people become an institution that contends with the institution and, 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 and make happen what it wants, what you all want to have. It's really the quandary. I love that framework of seeing like people as a collective, as like their own institution. So thank you so much. Thank you. I love that question.
So beautiful. Melissa, would you like to jump in here? I'd love to. Hi, Saveri. It's really nice to meet you. And it's been wonderful learning from you and this conversation throughout tonight. Um, so I'm Melissa. I study psychology and sociology at Stanford. And so as a social science student, I've been really interested in the role of labels and language and how they structure our experiences and our identities. And earlier you mentioned how you work with language so much in your own practice. And so I was wondering if you could speak a bit about how we use language to separate different migrant, ex migrant experiences, for example, like using terms like refugee or undocumented, citizen, illegal, legal, um, and how we even use language to separate other social identities as well and how that plays into, into your work. I mean, we speak English, right? We speak English because in this country, it's the, it's the major language in this country because it's colonized by Europeans, by, by British English speaking people, right? Like, so, you know, the language is tied to the weapons and who has the weapons. It's tied to the majority population and how that, and, and it's tied to the oppression. So we, we you know, as, as non-white people are basically forced to um, use language that is very violent, that violates ourselves and then violates our loved ones and the people around us. And it's something that I think we understand as we're using this language, but it's something that we cannot help because we are entangled inside of this system. So again, it's about reclaiming language. It's about um, making sure that languages are, are, are spoken, you know, in the household that, you know, creating even personal languages. I mean, it, I mean, I think it's, this is what I want to say, I, what I'm realizing as I mature is that it takes a lot to be a human being. It takes a lot. It, it takes a lot to, 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 to fully understand where you are and then what you need to do and what your mission is. It's a lot of labor. And I think we have to kind of ready ourselves for the labor that has to happen, not just like our work labor, but our like like being a human being labor. What does that mean? And some parts of that is working with language so that we are not being violent with our language through using terms like refugee uh, and all of these kinds of terms that don't even resonate with us. Those terms are about um, an oppression that continues and a, a continuing oppression. And I think, again, this is not really our issue. It's a, it's a problem, but it is not of our making. I think that you need to, there, there really needs to be a group of the majority population that starts to untangle the language and, and, and starts to stop calling people things that they are not, you know? We have a lot of work to do. Whew. Absolutely. And just uplifting different language, you know, like the amount of people who have used the word anti-racist in the last handful of months that have, you know, completely 180'd in their understanding of, of these concepts and, and these kind of these new frameworks has just been pretty remarkable and how that can shift action as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I also want to just underscore what you said too about, you know, students' responsibility for accountability. Um, of institutions and even to pull in Ida's history, we were founded as a result of student activism back in 1968. And, mm. you know, so student activism has been deeply, has deeply shaped Stanford's trajectory. Um, student activists of color have deeply shaped Stanford's trajectory and it's been um, nothing but an uphill battle. And so one of the things that we learned when we brought back those original activists in 1968 who responded to the taking back of the mic was, what are you learning now from this group that you yeah. didn't have when you were there? And it was self-care. It was, I don't mean that in the foo-foo way we hear it now mainstream, but it's like with revolution has to come rest yeah. and holding those two things together, self-preservation is the key to longevity. So as we say, hold these institutions accountable, we also say, hold yourselves and hold each other um, and rest as part of that deep. I deep say, so. yes. For sure. I, 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 and I just want to add to that really quickly. I, I my mother was a kind of like different type of person. And so I grew up Buddhist actually. So I, 
and, and I don't want to romanticize that practice and that, 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 that kind of space, but I will say that what I learned is kind of um, from her was um, repetition and meditation, of course, and also pause. And that's something that I think keeps me going is that kind of like constant nourishment and pause. Now, I don't want to rent romanticize Buddhism because it is its own thing, structural thing, but there are some elements inside of it that um, really help you do self-care, take care of the self. Because we all we got. <laughs> we had time for a couple more questions. Your questions have been so spot on. Um, so we thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and if anybody in the audience has questions that they'd like to share, please feel free to jump them into the Q&A section. Um, and we have room for maybe two more questions from, from students. So please take it away. Yeah, um, sort of jumping off of your um, statement about like words and, and sort of like the implications of using certain words like refugees um, as like, you know, mechanisms of oppression. Um, I'm curious to like, how you've experienced like the legacies of decolonization or like how you've experienced the legacies of colonization specifically within your time in like the art space um and by art space i mean like professional like you know like working with museums and and industries and yeah exhibits yep hmm. i mean i i'm gonna keep that answer brief but i mean you know museum world museum labor i mean it is a it is a it is a colonial practice, you know, I mean, even, you know, philanthropy, all of it is a, is a colonial practice. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's embedded, it's intertwined. It is, it is, it is, it is part of, it's part, it's the structure. I mean, that's an excellent question. I mean, it's, it, it is the same structure. It's a mini structure of the larger structure. Can I say it like that? Like it is a, it is a microcosm of the, the larger picture. And, uh, you know, I, I try to write about these things. I try to um, engage with communities to, to, to undo some of these things. But I also understand that this structure is larger than my body, right? And I can only push so much. And then there is a moment where I have to take care of the self and understand, um, that I also like to make beautiful things. And I also like to put embed materials with meaning. And so I have to, you know, go in and out of a, a very rigorous um, look at the colonial structures inside of the country and inside of the museum structure. And then I have to, I have to pause, you know, but the museum structure historically is a colonial space. We know that, you know what I mean? It's, it's, that's a whole, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for addressing it as best as you could. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's an excellent question though. Truly is. We have room for one more. Um, this isn't quite a question, um, but just, just to, um, tie tied together um, uh, our threads on student activism on um, on uh, the importance of um, students to apply pressure um, and accountability to the university I definitely wanted to to bring into the space and bring into the conversation um, the um, the current um, campaign and, and decades ongoing struggle for the departmentalization of African and African American studies um, and uh, you know, recognizing uh, all that, um, uh, I guess, all that we know about our university because of this very blatant example of uh, deprioritization of, um, of uh, Black knowledge, of uh, Black intellectualism. Um, uh, you know, I, I said this wasn't quite a question, but, um, I guess you know the the students who have been who have been working on that um, and who have been um, you know tirelessly again and again um, uh, finding different modes and methods to to um, to keep this on the top of of uh, 
people's radar on the top of people's agenda. Um, I guess I'd love to hear your take on 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 um, this particular issue about what this says about where we are, what this says about where we're going, um, um, what more we can be doing from here. So I, I might need a little clarification because I don't know all the inner workings of the university, but so mm -hmm. Stanford doesn't have a African-American studies program? Is that, we have am I a wrong? Program. We have a program, yes. And, and we've had a program for over 50 years. And now the move is to, um, the move in the, in the current um, uh, struggle and issue is about providing adequate resources for, for the people in that program um, uh, uh, to continue flourishing for that program to grow with um, the, the institutionalization of department status. So, so- It's not uh, a full department? It is not a full department. That's a, that's a shame. I, I need, where are the white folks on this call? <laughs> you guys got to come out here and don't let all these black folks do all this labor. Like you guys got to answer these questions because I'm trying to, I want to, I want to know my, I, I'm, I'm, I'm now a student. Like I want to understand why there isn't a push from the faculty and the staff to make this happen. Like this, this is, this is, we are, Okay, black folks have been here for 400 years. Like, if you are not ready to make sure that we have all the things that we need at this point, then you will never. And that is, that is unacceptable. So it is unacceptable. I don't even have language for, 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 the, for the question. Like, I, I don't even have language for this. My only, my only language is, what is happening? Who, what, where's the president of the school? Like, what is happening? Like, why would you deny this group of people uh, the status that they deserve? I mean, we bring the culture, we bring everything. This is, this is, I don't even have language. I don't really don't have language for what you just said to me, besides what I just said. I am in shock. Where, where are the white folks here? <laughs> well, oh my God. Hmm. I'm actually like I, I'm 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 hurt. I'm hurt. Siberia, I hear exactly what you say. I'm appearing on screen as a white person, not because I have any expertise or knowledge, um, but to thank you for holding us accountable, and also to the students for holding us all accountable, um, and hoping that I can gracefully transition to opening the Q&A, but also encouraging anyone else on the call if they'd like to um, respond to Siberia and the students, that you can also drop that in the chat to the panelists and we'll convey um, your thoughts. While we're waiting for that, um, we did have one question in the chat earlier. Um, Michelle asks, do we owe the black community who is we and what is owed um that's an e thank you michelle love that question <laughs> um yes we do owe the black community we are the united states we benefited from 400 plus years of oppression basically we benefited off of the forced uh uh, how do I say this? You know, we benefited off of the, the taking of land of First Nations people. We benefited off of the forced labor of Black folks and Brown folks, but definitely slavery lasted almost 300 years. And then we, under, we all know all of this. Like this is easy, easy information to understand. Like, I don't even need to work this hard, right? Like, we know all this. Any of these students can explain to you the mechanics and basics of the United States. The United States has kept good records. The federal government legalized slavery. So therefore, it's the federal government that we have the claim upon because it is individual companies as well. I mean, Aetna, they insured slave ships. I mean, we know this, you know, JC Morgan, JP Morgan, uh, you know, they lent money to enslavers. I mean, we know there's a record of who the planters were who owned slaves. There's a record of the, I live in South Street Seaport. There's a record of the, the traders, 
There's a record of the slave, some of the slave traders in Africa. I mean, there's a record of all this stuff. Like we're, it's not just like, oh my God, what a confusion. You know, the United States legally sanctioned the owning of people. You know, that's the we, we owe it. The taxpayers, we owe, we have a debt and we have to pay it. And I think until we get straight with that and accept that, we're just going to keep having these, you're going to do this to black people where you're going to keep us basically repeating the same thing over and over and over again. But the, even artists, and I just want to finish by saying, you know, there's black artists who tell this story over and over again. You know, there's Elizabeth Catlett. You can look at her whole body of work. You know, it's, the debt is clear. There's enough PhDs who have written enough theses on like all of this, dissertations, all of it. There's enough books in, to fill. It's, it's time. I think we have to stop doing this to black folks. It's really time. It's, we know, we know what's happening. It's, it's time. You know that, you know, the country was built on, you know, the backs of slavery and you know that you stole this land from first nations people who are still here. So what are you going to do? How, you, every, every family, white family especially, but a lot of other people have, be have benefited from this. What, is, what are you going to do? It's on you. It's really on you now. Thank you, Zyveria. That was really powerful. Um, while we're waiting for more questions to come in through the chat, everyone, please put your questions in the chat. Um, I have a question um, going back to thinking about academic spaces and um, academic museums. And this question is for all of you on the call. Um, have there been times, specific examples that you might wanna share where you felt that you were able to take a conversation in a, in a more powerful direction because you were on a university campus than you might otherwise have? Or conversely, have there been times when you've been on a university campus or in other academic spaces or academic museums where you felt exactly the opposite, where you felt that it was absolutely not a safe space to do that? <laughs> Isn't that the nature of it all? <laughs> I, um, I'll just try, you know, try to jump in here. I, I just appreciate, you know, um, I appreciate just the role that you've played as a visiting artist and scholar this evening, because I feel like the realest you can be is when you're coming in for an evening and exiting out the next, and that's when I felt the most able to speak the truth without fear of recourse. Um, you know, when you're speaking at, on behalf of and within your home institution, there are all of these hoops and reframings and toning downs that you have to do because you know that you're gonna be there for the long term. And that is, you know, in theory, the hope. Um, but I, I, I love how you've taken um, Siberia, this, this space and opportunity, which to just be, just say what needs to be said so that we can just, you know, get that, hear that, and then be implicated in that. And so I, I just echo that and, and just say like, sometimes the, the best place you can the best position you can hold is a, as a visitor um, because you're not beholden to the everyday negotiations that exist within an institution space. Um, and you know, it's the long game, not the short game. So there, yeah. there's my answer. I would, I would add uh, from this perspective, I, I think Saveri gave us an important answer to your question uh, in, in a different direction. So the, the point that we know what we're dealing with and we know what needs to happen to repair. So to your question, Maggie, the, the benefit and the joy of being able to have these conversations on university campuses is that we deal with people who are genuinely curious. We want to find things out, we want to figure out, and we want, you know, many of us want to try to do better with what we learn and figure out. The other side of that, you know, the converse to your question, Maggie, is we will study and committee something into the ground, even though there are decades of committees and studies on the very thing, 
And so that's one of the elements of being on a university campus that can prevent you know, the, the real, real conversations, you know, uh, as your question suggested. So back to Siberia's point, we know what needs repair, right? And, and we have a whole lot of, on record as, as, you know, our artist scholars told us about how to repair it. Now it's, and, and I think this, the, what, what breaks my heart and brings me such sadness about this conversation is that what you, what you do, and I'm gonna, I have, to, when I say white folks, there are non white folks who are white folks. I will just say that, but I use white folks just because it's just, it's natural for me to say. But what white folks do is you keep us in a repetitive loop. It's a digital space, actually, going back to Adam. It's a digital space where we continuously have to unearth and repeat the same things over and over again. And we are not actually believed for what we know as truth. And the research is there. And the, and the data and statistics and numbers are all there provided by the United States government. And so it's, a, it's up Stanford, which in particular, in, in, in the area that you guys are in with the, the amount of computer technology could literally build the computer that deals with this stuff. Like the computer probably could like figure out like, okay, reparation, this, stop land back that all of it all of it and probably like a year and we could be done with this like this is ridiculous that we're still having these conversations it's silly it's actually a waste of our brain power and i and i have to say that and i'm i i'm glad i'm the visitor <laughs> you know i'm sorry to the people who are here that are permanent but like it's you're doing the black folks on this on the in these places a disservice because we are just much more brilliant than we're allowed to be. Wow. We have a comment in the chat that I want to share. Alex writes in, he says, I, and I'm sorry, I didn't actually right check now. if Alex is he or a woman or what you identify. Alex, Alex writes, I am a white alum, Stanford art history class of 2011 most powerful and transformative course I took in my four years at Stanford was Black Feminist Theory. It was a seminar taught by then graduate student Elisa Bieria. More of this type of course offering at the intersections of Black studies, gender, and politics, which changed my entire academic trajectory at Stanford, would undoubtedly benefit the university. This is an anecdote in support of the transformative work that could result from departmentalizing African and African American studies at Stanford. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Thank you, Alex, always. Send in your testimonials, everyone. Alex, you got to get your um, alumni friends together and go over to the who's office, the dean, the provost, I don't know, any, the, the, the whoever, and just be like, I demand this. Now, it, we need a whole influx of white folks to just be like, I demand it. That's it. Stop with all the like academic speak and just do it. Mm -hmm. We've got a um, comment in the in the chat also. Uh -uh. Uh, it's less a question than a comment. Uh, Kate writes in the discussion around language. She was reminded of a famous quote by Antonio de Nebrija, who studied and wrote on the Spanish language in the 15th century. He wrote language was always the companion of empire. This is 1492 when European nations were on the precipice of invasions and colonialist expansions in the Americas. So the colonizers understood this from the get-go, which I think is a great reminder that we are never as innocent as we think. And I think um, you you said that before. I love, yeah. I mean, yeah. Like, just <laughs> oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go, you go. I mean, just highlighting another, another uh, Thing that's being pushed heavily by students and alumni is the retainment of Cantonese and uh, languages on campus. And when we think about our um, First Nation Indigenous colleagues, language revitalization is at the heart and root of reclaiming um, identity, culture, land, space. And so just wanted to highlight that, that it's nothing is anti-political. <laughs> Everything 
um, you know, the removal of, at, at this point, it was one professor that was teaching that course, which was the entire wow. program of Cantonese. And so, you know, just the intention around that and how language is deeply rooted to our understanding of identity and, and is a deep part of liberatory practice. So thank you That's so much. That's amazing, thank you. Well, if we have any more questions come in through the chat, I'll be happy to convey them. Um, but we've got just a few more minutes left on the call. And so I wanna say thank you so much, Siberia, Alan, Adam, Melissa, Ayawade, and Sadie. Thank you so much. This has been an absolutely incredible conversation. Um, I feel really privileged to have um, introduced you all and to have been here to listen to it. And I wanna thank everyone out there for attending tonight's conversation on migration and museums and many other things, mm -hmm. um, which has been the virtual opening of When Home Won't Let You Stay. Please enjoy exploring the exhibition through our upcoming programs and the website and virtual tour. So upcoming events include a public artist talk with media artist um, Isaac Julian and an artist talk with local artist Diana Lee, who um, will be visiting for Stanford students. And you can visit the exhibition at the link that I am about to drop in the chat and which you see there on the screen. On the website, um, you can see featured artworks, the virtual tour, you can learn more with bibliographies and you can also join the conversation yourself um, by sending in your own testimonials and answering specific questions. So I did that in just a few minutes. So if you've got any last questions in the last two minutes, You've got a moment now, but thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Well, I just want to say thank you to the students for asking those really amazing questions. And, and thank you, you, just brilliant questions. And thank you all so much for um, having me. And, and whole, you know, the time is now white folks let's go <laughs> and and you know don't 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 let these black folks do all this labor anymore it's too we're tired we're tired we thank you so much Siberia. this was like that cool drink of water you know in so many ways nourishing poignant right on time and so thank you so much for spending the evening with us thank you Keep in touch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, everyone.